Good afternoon and welcome to our session on funding the real economy. Now, so far, the corporate sector, at least large companies that use wholesale capital markets, has been having a good crisis. In fact, it's the second good crisis in a row, as the 2008 one didn't really cause a meltdown in corporate credit. Spreads went up last year when the pandemic arrived, but have come down again, in many cases to pre-pandemic levels. And while yields have started to rise, they're still very close to all-time lows. But are things too good to be true? Companies have always got to be vigilant about their funding. So what are the risks to look out for? And how are companies going to finance the enormous low carbon transition that's needed across the economy? Here with me to discuss these issues and more, I have an excellent panel from the corporate sector, investors and banking. And I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves one by one. So uh, let's start, Alessandro, with you. Hello, everybody. It's Alessandro Canta speaking, uh, Head of Finance and Insurance at Enel. Thank you. And Mathieu? Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Mathieu Boucherie, the Head of uh, the Treasury and Financing at Orange. And uh, Maureen? Hello, everyone. Maureen Baker, um, Global Head of Funding and Capital Markets for ArcelorMittal. Thank you, Monica. Good afternoon, everybody. Monica Rust, Deputy Head of CIB Germany and Head of Multinational Corporates Germany at Unicredit. Hi, and Tatiana. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tatiana Grail Castro, and I'm co head of public markets at Musenichinko. And Pierre. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pierre Verlet, head of credit at Carmignac. Thank you. So COVID-19 has been an extraordinary, unprecedented shock to the economy. But remarkably, so far, the damage to the corporate sector seems to have been quite limited. Is that a complacent view, though? Is there hidden damage? Or is it still early days? And are we going to see corporate failures start to mount up as government support is withdrawn? Um, Tatiana, would you like to go first on that? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, well, interestingly, um, you know, as you indicated earlier, you wouldn't have thought that um, there is uh, so much government support and, uh, and, and such a decline in, uh, in economic activity when you look at the strength of uh, corporate balance sheets. And that really was based on uh, the monetary stimulus and support and fiscal support um, that started in April last year, March, April last year. And what that meant was that um, the, the, the bond market and also the equity market, generally markets, uh, calmed down significantly and allowed companies to raise liquidity. And uh, that's what companies have done um, across the board from investment grade to high yield. Uh, the market um, opened up very quickly and um, the liquidity broadly sits on companies' balance sheets, especially uh, the, what, the sectors with... Um, a bigger impact of the crisis. So they raised, they raised cash and put it on balance sheets. So any short term um, earnings decline, they can sustain with the liquidity that they have issued uh, over the last 15 months or so. Uh, and that has kept um, uh, default rates extremely low. And we expect it to continue. So as long as the markets remain open um, and, um, and, and a lot of it has been pre-funded already. Thank you, Tatiana. Pierre, um, are, are you as confident? Uh, I, I don't want to sound like a, a doomsayer, and, uh, and, and clearly the monetary and fiscal uh, supports have uh, averted a liquidity crisis. And in my view, it, it became clear from you know March, end of March, uh, 20, 2020. But uh, there is certainly hidden damage because you know you you, you not only have entire part of the economy which have lost quarters and sometimes more than a year of uh, revenues while still incurring a lot of their cost. The total level of indebtedness has, has risen. Uh, even good businesses have had to uh, issue expensive, uh, expensive debt. Um, but we, we are not, we didn't have, and I don't think we're going to have uh, good businesses because, you know, defaulting for lack of capital. Capital is abundant. 
uh, this is a new norm. It's 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 actually it, it was a pre-existing trend before the COVID-19 crisis, but now uh, it's clear that what we are considering as unconventional monetary policies have become uh, has become the the norm. But having said that, um, last year and and still today, still this year, the default rates are kept artificially low. And what I mean. In addition to the scarcity of capital, which is not an issue and which I don't expect to be an issue in the in the in the foreseeable future, what drives uh, defaults and what causes uh, what causes defaults is disruption of business models and investors' mistakes. And the COVID-19 has accelerated uh, those disruptions. So I think we'll have uh, we'll have defaults. Uh, if we, we will have defaults because disruption um, disruptions happen. They happen actually faster than, than, than they used to. Uh, the environment pushes investors to make mistakes, so there will be defaults from investors' uh, mistake. And if any, at least at least you know we, we, we should have the catch up of the defaults we didn't have because the entire economy was frozen uh, has been frozen for more than a year. I was looking at the. At the, the data for bankruptcies of uh, you know small uh, SMEs, and they, they they were in France, and I think it's the same all over uh, Europe. They were 30% below in 2020 versus 2019, which doesn't make sense. So, if any, uh, we we should at least have the def to catch up with the defaults which would have happened without the COVID-19, um, you know, uh, happening in the in the future. And on top of that, more disruption. So again, I'm not a doomsayer, and I don't expect a massive wave of defaults, but I think we should get back to a more normalized level of default. And that's very good news because defaults are a necessity. Without defaults, never forget that debt, debt markets would allocate uh, capital in the poorest possible, uh, possible way. So we need a healthy uh, level of, uh, of, of, of default rate. Okay, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, Monica, you obviously talk to an, an enormous number of companies in your job. Um, are they all absolutely fine and happy? Are, are some of them worried they've taken on debt as a way to get through loss of revenue, but debt is not the same as revenue, is it? I think the severity how corporates have been hit during the crisis or affected depends very much on the sector and depends also on the geography they, they are um, located. Um, so in some countries, companies were hit harder, depending on the length of the lockdowns and, and the several COVID waves and also sector rise. Some um, are rising as, as winners from, from the pandemic and some are relatively neutral, but others have been hit harder, like um, in the travel, leisure and tourism industry. But um, and, and like Pierre said, I think there's also a difference in the size of companies. Um, in Germany, we see a decrease um, in, in solvency rate for mid caps and larger companies, while the trend for smaller companies is rising. So there's a difference in um, which size of you, the company you're looking at. But uh, I think we can overall say that the market was functioning throughout the crisis and provided ample liquidity uh, for companies looking for a boost in liquidity, also as a security buffer. And here clearly, Central banks played a key role, um, supporting also the depth of the market and uh, the fiscal stimulus included the, including the um, state guarantee supported the market significantly here. And um, like Pierre said, if you look into the numbers of the recently published insolvency rates in Germany, we saw a spike um, in the numbers in February, March, uh, but numbers came down again in, in May. Uh, very prom uh, promising numbers, and they are even slightly better than in 2019, um, despite the expiry of the moratoria. Um, and I think also if we compare the um, insolvency rates um, uh, with the financial crisis 2008-2009, um, uh, the, um, the numbers are also uh, significant lower since the outbreak of uh, the pandemic, it was uh, in, in Germany 5% and uh, during the financial crisis 13%. Um, and if you, if you see uh, the latest numbers also in, in the economy, um, how, um, at least in Germany, the, uh, um, uh, the effects of the, of the crisis um, are, are managed and um, the negative effects um, are reduced, um, and there you see that uh, some some sectors even come stronger than than before COVID, 
And uh, one factor I think which has to be monitored is um, supply chains, because that's limiting some sectors in their productivity um, and um, we, because we see shortage there. But otherwise, I wouldn't see a big wave like Pierre also said there. Yes, there is some. Um, um, uh, there, there could be some insolvencies like we have seen, but I do not expect any big wave to come. OK, thank you. Now, um, we we you've mentioned and and it's generally felt that the corporate credit market performed very well under the strain of COVID. Um, but in reality, there, there was that the cracks started to show pretty quickly. And there were there was a week or two in March last year when things looked dicey, even markets like commercial paper and the US Treasury market were under strain. And, and what it needed was a massive backup from the government and uh, from the monetary authorities and which which was forthcoming very quickly this time. But will does this mean that the corporate debt market will now always need this sort of nanny looking after it? Um, Alessandra, you've been through one or two crises. What were you worried by? It? And do you think, uh, yes, you know, we need this nanny from now on? OK, let me say that uh, we discovered to be vulnerable. Uh, to internal and external factor. Internal factor factors caused by us basically was the Lehman bankruptcy. So all the market uh, uh, participant had uh, the responsibility. But uh, and now we discovered to be vulnerable to external factor, the pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. You correctly said that the reaction of uh, the authorities has been tremendous and immediate because now they have the experience of the previous crisis. Since the, the sentence, whatever it takes, uh, we learn uh, some very important uh, uh, things. First of all, that uh, as uh, also Pierre and Monica said, we have to come back to normality by which company can uh, make a failure due to their uh, wrong choices uh, or to, let's say, the mismanagement of the company. But when it comes to the other factors, the macroeconomic external factors uh, that we discovered to be vulnerable, vulnerable at. I think that, uh, uh, I mean, we learned that there are uh, a lot of uh, umbrella uh, that, uh, uh, that covers the market in a normal situ uh, situation. Uh, coming back to your question, sure, we have to walk uh, alone, uh, like a, a famous song uh, was saying, <laughs> we have to come back to walk alone. Uh, mm -hmm. because otherwise the market uh, will, uh, say, certain manner be dragged uh, with too much, too much uh, uh, leveraging on that. Uh, and this is not uh, uh, positive for the market itself. Uh, the exit from uh, the enormous quantity of stimulus that we are living uh, uh, today would be very, very sensible. So we cannot exit from a, a day to the other one. Le let's remember when uh, in the United States they started some years ago to speak about tapering. The market, I mean, uh, was shocked by this uh, possible exit. So we have to be uh, at the same time uh, able to exit from uh, uh, this enormous uh, quantity of stimulus that we are leading, uh, like we have been able to enter into. Uh, because I mean, probably we are uh, not have understood uh, what is going on in the market today. A huge quantity of stimulus in the United States, some packages that are incredible. Uh, central bank pumping liquidity since uh, 2010, 2011. Um, fiscal stimulus, but not only. Uh, um, the European Commission has overcome the long-standing debate about uh, issuing uh, common debt uh, in some months after mm. they will have mm. not resolved to do it in years. Mm. So a lot of very interesting are happening. And so I don't want, we don't want the market uh, to leverage too much on that. Mm. Uh, so we, we have to find a way to say, calm down and uh, go for a, a, let's say, steady exit from su such a kind of package, stimulus, whatever it takes. But uh, bearing in mind that for the benefit of the market, if they're gonna be in another external shock, we have all the weapons already established in order to cover the market itself by external unpredictable factors. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's interesting. Um, Maureen, are, are you worried by the the market sort of loss of independence and the and the fact that it, perhaps it isn't walking alone anymore? 
Uh, hello. Um, first of all, I would just like to comment um, that I agree with all of Alessandro's points, which were very good points. Um, no, I'm not nervous, actually. I think that um, the, uh, you know, the government's support um, was required at a certain period because, quite frankly, the um, we were really facing an unprecedented situation and the magnitude and the duration of the crisis were, were really unknown, completely unknown. But no, I think that uh, the market should function well without government support. Um, I think there will be other forms of government support rather than just intervening in the market. And I think that the uh, transactions um, will um, will get done on their own, quite frankly. And perhaps, perhaps with the government's support, maybe there were some trans transactions that got done that shouldn't have gotten done, maybe. <laughs> Um, you mentioned other forms of government support uh, other than intervening in the market. What, what did you mean by that? Um, I'm talking um, about um, the uh, perhaps the Eno Fund, the Innovation Fund from EIB, and I just I just believe right. that governments will be there, not necessarily for the capital markets, but to help uh, to help the economy. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, Mathieu, um, you also uh, survived this period. Um, and um, we, we're talking about the need to come back to normality. Um, and, you know, speakers have said that that's desirable. But but is there a way out, you know, or, or is everybody too hooked on QE? Um, first, maybe. Maybe let me say that for me, it's a, it's a very different crisis from before. I Meaning it's, it's a pandemic, so it's not coming from overproduction or coming from uh, the financial markets. So I think that the measures that were taken uh, back in March and April last year were really uh, adequate, but also specific to this crisis. So now for, I, I would think that um, we need to, to get out of this uh, situation in a progressive way. If we look at short term, uh, and I agree with, uh, with what I say, has been said before, and especially what Pierre said, um, you have, uh, before we entered the crisis, you had the non-viable business model and viable business model. And all these companies uh, stayed uh, more or less uh, viable during the crisis, thanks to all the, the liquidity in the market and the subsidies. Now the question is, how do you get out of this? And in order to allow the viable business model to continue, and uh, and you have to accept the fact that you need to catch up on the on the on the fact that uh, you need to stop the non-viable business models. So the reality is, I expect that there will be a catch up of bankruptcy. But linked to the, the situation of some uh, eco, some uh, mar some sectors and some companies before the pandemic, and so we need to get out of uh, of the, the the subsidies and the help progressively to make sure that the viable business model uh, stay alive um, and, and continue. I'm also uh, very focused on the long term uh, consequences of this pandemic because I think this will drive some changes on the financial markets. Liquidity will stay very strong for a long time, even if it will reduce over time. But also, they will, it's, it's going to accelerate some changes in, in the corporates and in some markets. Uh, I, I think especially on the digitalization and also on the, on the CSR and all uh, aspects linked to sustainable finance. So I think there will be long-term changes. So there will be also new business model uh, that will work better. Some existing business model will work uh, as before, uh, and some of new business model, some business model will be uh, less viable. So on the long term, uh, there will be changes to the economy. So this is why I think uh, all the, the the ecosystem, the financial ecosystem today, needs to uh, to uh, to take a phase out in a progressive way. That's really interesting, Mathieu. Thank you. Um, uh, Tatiana, um, the, um, we, we're getting this picture of the, the economy 
in a way having you know changes have been accelerated by covid at the same time they've been kept still you know there's been this sort of deep freeze effect where where you know defaults haven't happened of companies that otherwise would have gone gone bust everybody's saying you know it's desirable to get back to sort of more natural risk pricing and for for business models that are failing to fail um and i want to i want to ask you you know when when that's going to happen um what what effects it's going to have on the market and and maybe you can also tie it to the question of interest rates because that's often the thing that actually provokes a shakeout isn't it yeah it's interesting to listen to everybody because everybody says what should happen now there's a difference between what we think should happen and what would happen okay go on what, and, what is the difference and, and me as a market participant you know one thing you learn hopefully very early on that you are not making decisions based on what you think should happen you need to make decisions based on what is likely to happen and there's a big difference sometimes um so given you know when you when you look back uh you know you you, you brought in the financial crisis the response to the financial crisis was very different it was responded by austerity. The response to this crisis is to throw a lot of money at the issue and also uh, make the most of the crisis. And sustainability has come in many times over. Now, for instance, some of those business models, they, would have, they wouldn't have suffered at all if it hadn't been for the crisis. Should they go bankrupt? Who benefits from it if it goes bankrupt? And there's other models, um, you know, where yes, you know, things change and um, uh, they either may get bought out or, you know, there's, there's other ways to uh, sort of uh, to restructure it. So there, there is the big difference. So, um, and I, I, I do believe that um, generally uh, with that liquidity, uh, the amount of liquidity that has been created, it is extremely difficult to bring it back to pre-pandemic levels. It is unlikely to happen. I don't think it will, uh, because the increase was just too much. Now there will be tapering, yes, but uh, will it go back to pre-pandemic levels? Most likely not. Um, and and then when it comes to to interest rates and inflation, um, I'm really in the camp with the Fed. I know the market has been changing their minds um, many times over. Didn't believe the Fed, wouldn't listen to the Fed. Then you know, then then then, then they very much believed the Fed. Then they said, well, you know, the Fed was behind the curve. Now it's ahead of the curve. So there's a lot of narrative around the change in interest rates. Um, some of it is probably just driven by technicals. And then the narrative is trying to explain um, um, sort of the underlying fundamental change, even though there hasn't been an underlying fundamental change. It's just that the technical, the technical drivers have changed. So you always have to be careful not to read too much into those changes. Because if you do, you may make a policy mix, mix mistake or you make also an investment mistake. So, um, you know, to me, if somebody says I need to see if inflation is persistent, by definition, it takes time to know if it's persistent or not. You can't know in two months if something is persistent. So uh, if you use the word, uh, the word persistent, by definition, it will take time. Yeah. And uh, the Fed has repeated that many times over and has reiterated it yesterday again. So um, so we have to see if it, if it is persistent or not. Um, again, bringing in sustainability and all the changes that if, if the pledge by most governments around the world, um, if they take it seriously, if it becomes more than a pledge, um, if there is actually an implementation to get our economies and our businesses to become sustainable, and go to net zero, huge investments will have to be made. And I would think that that will support inflation uh, being higher than it was over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and then we'll have to see by how much higher. Um, and interest rates then are likely to normalize. And I think everybody in fixed income at least is wishing for that to happen. Um, and that is just to protect yourself against the next crisis where you need interest rates to be able to come lower again. Mm. Pierre, um, lower for longer, we've got so used to it. It's almost a law in financial markets and it's it's existed for 40 years, this uh, essentially decline in interest rates. Do we really think it, that's going to change now? Um, and, and if so, is that going to be the catalyst that brings these defaults you've expected? 
No, I mean, I don't think we are going to see uh, significantly uh, higher uh, rates in the future. I mean, we, we, we live in financial repression, uh, in a period of financial repression. And if you want to get rid of an excessive uh, indebtedness, you know, you have, as far as I know, three ways. Uh, defaults, jubilee, that is, you know, uh, um, forgiveness. The, for giving for giving for giving the debt or uh, erosion uh, you know with um, with uh, rates uh, lower than uh, lower than, uh, than, than than inflation and we we live you know in the eurozone and uh, in switzerland uh, we in a, in a world of uh, negative nominal rates but almost everywhere in the developed uh, world we live in a world of um, of negative real rates, and it's very difficult to to see um, why we would uh, we would stop that because nobody wants to get rid of the of the debt in the abrupt uh, manners I've, uh, I've, I've 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 described um, earlier. So, I, I mean, of course, we'll have fluctuation because when the market relies, I mean, if there is uh, more inflation, and I, I I agree with Tatiana, I I think we we should have more inflation, hopefully. Um, than uh, than we had in the last uh, 10, uh, 10 years, but not um, you know creating a massive uh, massive uh, spike in in rates. And even if we had you know a one percent rise in uh, in risk free uh, in risk free rates, it's in my view not going to create um, uh, to increase defaults. If you if you think about high quality issuers. Um, by definition, they can they can they can support very well. They can they can they can tolerate very well uh, an increase in their cost of uh, funding by one percent. And for the low quality low quality issuers, well, it's not that important compared with uh, the spreads they, they 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 should they should pay. So for me, the the real risk, um, which could create a massive uh, default uh, wave of defaults, but uh, would be that liquidity becomes scarce, but I don't think liquidity will become scarce. I think we'll have just a, a, a catch up of defaults of uh, failing business models, which maybe have been uh, sustained for, 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 for too long, but, um, but I don't expect to, I don't expect to, to see again, you know, uh, an environment where you can, you can make a, a strong returns buying a high quality issuers or where you can make 8% buying a, uh, a relatively decent uh, high yield issuer. It's um, it, we we live, and in my view, we're going to live for a long time in an environment with plenty of capital. But that doesn't mean that the that the failing businesses will uh, will 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 survive uh, indefinitely. Thank you, um, Maureen. Um, you know, we're talking about rates going up. They are going up in the U.S. gradually. So far, it seems in a controlled fashion, but. Um, are you worried about that and and about the eventual exit from QE? So I think a little bit of inflation is is a good thing actually. I think if we have some inflation over the next three, four, five years, I mean we're looking at negative interest rates in Europe right now. So a little bit of increased inflation is uh, is I think not a bad thing or anything that we should be overly worried about. Of course, I heard Tatiana's comments also, but a little bit of inflation, slightly higher interest rates, I, I know we're not worried about them. And um, I don't think we're worried either about um, tapering, ending, or starting, I should say. I don't think QE ending, I don't think is um, is something that we are that we are concerned about. I think that execution should be able to Transactions should be able to execute it on their on their own merit. I think I think history w would support your point there, and um, uh, uh, let's hope you're right. Um, I, I want to turn to the to the issue of sustainability, and which several people have already mentioned. We've man we've managed not to talk about sustainability for a, a while, which is unusual in in financial markets uh, these days. So. Um, Monica, perhaps, perhaps uh, turning to you first, um, the focus on ESG is clearly intensifying. But I, I want to ask, you know, how is it going to play out? Um, the uh, are sustainability-linked uh, financing structures going to become the norm, 
Um, and how are companies going to finance less ESG friendly assets? Um, yes, um, I, I feel that they will become the norm and you can see it already in the market trend. Um, so um, those ESG topics have moved center stage and uh, gained relevance with Paris Agreement because um, um, which re uh, require the decarbonization of the whole society and economies. And um, we have already seen a tremendous growth in, in uh, green use of proceed financings, uh, but um, this is for already green assets. And you need also a financing instrument for the transition and to help issuers to focus um, on, on this uh, transitional financing. And SLB is one of those formats, uh, which is for general corporate purposes, but tied to sustainability goals. And um, um, this is an essential instrument uh, to support issuers in achieving their sustainability targets. Um, I think the uh, challenge there is more the uh, definition than on the, on the KPIs to, to really to have a proper um, SLB issuance and um, uh, to, to avoid that it will be um, uh, seen as, as uh, um, not properly defined um, uh, KPIs. And I think you can see, it, it, will it become the norm? I think with Alessandro from, from NL, we have a perfect example of an issuer today here because um, NL and, and um, Alessandro, I, I am sure you can comment on it. Um, you just issued your, uh, or the largest SLB um, uh, triple tranche um, in the market. And you have combined that launch also with a tender offer. Uh, targeting um, outstanding euro uh, notes with no ESG feature. Um, and uh, this um, helps you in the liability mix to, to bring everything more towards SLB. So you can already see the trend there. Um, but um, um, John, you were mentioning also the, um, the, uh, the uh, need for, for non-green. How do we finance that? And I think the focus needs to be uh, more on the um, so-called hard to abate industries, which are carbon emission intense, um, and um, because they there will be the largest effect, I think, in turning into uh, sustainable. And uh, those hard to to abate, um, it, it's more um, in the uh, in the steel industry. And I think Maureen, you you um, are also um, looking into that things. And uh, we have seen a milestone transaction in the market. Um, also showing us that um, um, with with Eni as the first um, oil and and gas issuer um, from one of these hard to abate industries um, um, looked into an SLB transaction um, just two weeks ago, and um, I think that's that's uh, paving the way for more other industries and issuers um, out of those sectors to enter the market and um, to tackle the transition. Thanks, Monica. Yeah, uh, uh, Alessandra, you you started the SLB uh, trend, and and I it was very interesting at the time. You you told me very early on we're going to only do this from now on, but I want and and you've stuck to it. But I want to ask: Is do you think the rest of the world is going to go that way? It's very difficult to say what's going to happen because there is a, a revolution of spending, a positive revolution of spending. It has been amplified by the, the crisis that we are living, the pandemic. Uh, so we have commented, all of us during this panel, uh, for sure we're going to have the benefit of having external support, the liquidity will be there, but on the sustainability, and you correctly were saying that, I mean, we have established a record, not speaking about sustainability for 30 minutes. Uh, because now is the name of the game. There is a revolution by which we cannot say what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, uh, we have been one pioneer of this revolution. A lot of us were speaking about uh, sustainability since a long while, but uh, most uh, some, uh, someone of us for green labeling, let me say. Uh, nice to have on the investor side, nice to have on the issuer side. But I mean, uh, was uh, a little restricted uh, numbers of people speaking about sustainability. Now, all the government, all the institution, all the blended finance, uh, all the package, uh, all the stimulus, everything goes in this direction. So we cannot say if uh, tomorrow morning or for the next two years uh, there will be all issuer issuing sustainable link bond. We have been very pleased to see, as uh, Monica said, an oil company accompanying its own transition with this format. Uh, 
we don't want to self celebrate too much the, the format that we have invented, but we invented the format just to stimulate the debate, stimulate the uh, positive behavior that such a kind of product, uh, fortunately, uh, are, 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 are procuring to us. Um, on the other side, uh, no matter what is going to be the product, no matter what is going to be the name, the most important thing is, first of all, all of us uh, have uh, a unique intent. So I've never seen, uh, the, say, this uh, unique, uh, say, convergence of interest between public and private institution. And uh, we're going to see, really, fortunately, all the world going, going in this direction with uh, the capability that all the managers like us have to channel the huge quantity of money that are ready to be invested. Uh, so we cannot say what's going to be tomorrow of uh, news uh, or something news or something, but uh, for sure going to be something that will be aligned uh, with the transition we are living. Thank you, Alessandro. Um, Mathieu, um, you also are on a transition. You've got, uh, like the rest of the economy, to go to net zero. So I'm interested in, you know, are, what are the financing um, availabilities for you is there is is there going to be the financing support from the markets for for what you've got to do and what role are, are these sort of specialist instruments going to play do you think um, my, my view is that there are this type of instruments will be more and more important um for for two reasons first from the inside uh, because we we did our first uh, sustainability bond at orange last year and uh, what really uh, struck me is that uh, people in the company are really keen to see how you can match fi finance on sustainability, meaning that how do you align your uh, CSR commitments with your way you finance the company. So for me, from the inside, when you do that, uh, you help uh, to promote and accelerate uh, the transition and the positive impact. And from the outside, um, really, really for me, I welcome the fact that investors would not only la look at uh, how much interest rate they could get from a bond, but also the fact that on top of interest rate, investors could have a positive impact. So as an issuer, I know that in the coming years, I will have to offer more and more products that offers interest and a positive impact. Now, for me, in terms of format, today we have sticked to uh, traditional sustainability bonds with targeted investments. And I say sustainability bonds because we not only do green, we also do social. And so when we move to uh, SLB bonds, then the question is, what are the KPIs that will be uh, valuable for investors on issuer? On the green side, it's easier than on the social side. And that's really the question. And we are waiting for on our side to, to get more sense about this and the markets to become slightly more mature to come in the game. Very interesting, but it, you're clearly thinking about it. Yeah. Um, uh, Maureen, now you're in one of these hard to abate sectors, and I'm interested to hear what your uh, experience has been uh, with the ESG interest of investors. Are they uh, sort of asking you about this all the time? And and what you know? And do you think these instruments would would help you, or is it more about just your overall ESG messaging? So first of all, there has been tremendous interest from investors, uh, both equity and fixed income with regard to ESG. We also um, think it's really important to be out participating in ESG conferences um, and to be communicating and to be answering questions and to be dialoguing with investors. So we're doing that anyway. Um, so uh, we have not been in the capital markets with any uh, uh, green or SLB transactions. Um, we have been following, of course, what Enel did. We did uh, we did uh, transform our five billion dollar corporate uh, banking facility into an ESG facility. 
Okay, so it's also a very important topic for us and uh, we'll be monitoring it and looking at it um, closely. Thank you. Um, so um, I think uh, we, we're going to have to finish quite soon, but um, I want to ask um, just a couple more things. One is uh, Monica, you know, when, when issuers come to the market with an ordinary corporate bond, right? They, um, some of them have put their ESG ratings on, on, in the announcement about it. And I'm interested in whether you think that's a good idea. Is that going to grow? Um, do investors, can they actually make sense of this information given that um, often the ratings are quite different? I, I think there you have to differentiate for, especially for the, the large issuers um, that you have on the ESG side, the solicited uh, ESG ratings, which are initiated by the issuer and the corporate itself. And then the unsolicited uh, ESG rating, which are um, autonomously um, done uh, and analyzed on publicly available information and documents um, from the ESG rating agency as such. And uh, they might not take into account all ESG aspects uh, that the company has already taken internally and maybe not communicated. So, uh, meaning, in, in other words, if, if you are a large corporate and um, the majority is covered already with ESG rating, be it uh, solicited or unsolicited, um, the uh, ESG rating agencies will publish it anyhow if the company likes it or not. So, um, there, it, it makes sense absolutely for, for the issuers to look into the ESG rating and then um to to address the certain uh, points which had been um mentioned and, and raised by the rating agencies and then to transparently uh, work on it um um that that would help and uh, we can just say from from um the different stakeholders be it own clients investors but also banks and the community it adds transparency um and it's an additional trusted source of information from a third party um giving that transparency Thank you. Um, now we, we've we've almost got to finish. Uh, um, so I'm just, we've got one question from the audience. I'm going to ask for somebody who can answer this in 20 seconds. Would more automation and digitization help the capital markets? Any volunteer? Matthew, I'm going to pick on you. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's, it's going that way. I mean, uh, oh, I, mean, I mean, I'm in fixed income. Uh, and uh, we are clearly far behind the equity market because we have so many securities, which makes it harder at the same time. Um, um, you know, when I look at the loan market, there is no need for it to be as slow as it is at the moment. Uh, there's only very few who benefit from it. And this is sort of the agency banks and, and that's it. Um, so there's definitely room for improvement from, from where I stand. OK, brilliant. Now, I'm very sorry to have to finish this so quickly. It feels very abrupt. But I want uh, to thank you very much indeed uh, for taking the time to be with us and share so many interesting thoughts with us and our audience. Um, it's been great talking to you all. Um, thank you also to the audience um, for your questions and, and for listening to us. And the session will be available on demand um, for a good while longer. Um, we're going to have a lunch break now, but please uh, join us again at uh, 1.45 London time um, for the next session, which is about uh, the banking sector and is moderated by Tyler Davis from Global Capital. Um, so once again, thank you so much to my excellent panel uh, for such a stimulating discussion.